Now, if you have ever been curious as to what a U.S. Army soldier is going to battle with, what gear do they have with them when they go into a combat zone or maybe even a training environment, well, stick around because in this video, that's what I'll be explaining. What's up, my friends? Welcome to an all new video. I'm U.S. Army veteran Christopher Chaos, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about what the Army loadout is. What do U.S. Army soldiers go into battle with, into training environments with? What kind of gear do they have on them in these kind of situations, weapons, all that kind of stuff? I'll be explaining that, and if that is the type of information that you're interested in, you're not familiar with my channel, well, that's what I like to do here. I like to try to educate you about the United States Army, different scenarios and everything, so if you are not already subscribed to this channel, maybe think about clicking on that subscribe button, even clicking on that bell, to get alerts as soon as new videos go live to include the live streams and become a part of that awesome notification platoon. So let's talk about the US Army loadout, or at least the common things at least. Now there are multiple variations as far as what gear soldiers carry, what they're gonna have with them as far as weapons and everything like that. I'm gonna first start off with talking about the most common one. I'll kind of get into some variations at the end, but be aware there are multiple variations that you know units can direct or MOSs or different things like that that can kind of play into the role as far as what a soldier is going to have with them. But like I said, I'll talk about the most common kind of setup that you might have for a US Army soldier. So we start off, of course, the uniform. Of course, they're gonna be wearing the combat uniform, the camouflage uniform, the OCPs. You're gonna be wearing your boots. You're gonna have these approved boots that you can wear. Other boots are not approved, right? You can't have like zippers on the sides and all sorts of things, right? So you're wearing the approved boots. You're gonna be wearing the, the pants that are you know, somewhat flame resistant on them. And then the top can kind of vary a little bit. So you can either go with the normal top that comes with the uniform. That one's typically a little bit hotter, especially when you're wearing the vest over top or they have what is called the combat shirt. I don't know if they have a more technical term for that shirt. It's just always been known as combat shirt that I've always known it as. They had the ACU version that I first had and then they later went to the OCP version when the OCP uniforms came out. But it just makes it a little bit more breathable, a little bit better, especially when you're wearing the vest. So it's not quite as hot, especially when you're in like an environment like Iraq or Afghanistan. Now, in addition, most units will require soldiers to wear gloves and eye protection when in like certain situations. So they'll have these Nomex gloves or these fire resistant gloves or whatever the case is. They have ones that the army will issue you, but you can go and use other ones. Like I had a pair of Oakley ones that were really great. They were fire resistant. They had the cool knuckles on them and everything like that. So soldiers will sometimes use those, but they have to at least have something that is approved and you know at least somewhat fire resistant. Along with that, they have to wear eye protection. So that does not include just simply wearing wearing glasses that usually isn't something you can get away with, sometimes maybe, but they prefer you to wear actually ballistic eyewear, so that way it'll help you from you know little things like sand or little pieces of rock or shrapnel or something like that. It's not obviously bulletproof or anything like that. They're not gonna prevent against an IED blast, but maybe smaller things from blinding you and everything to have some kind of protection, maybe a, a cartridge you know flying out from your battle buddy next to you, firing off some rounds or whatever, right? You see you have that ballistic eye protection that it's gonna bounce off of and be fine, right, for that cartridge, not a bullet bullet, but you know, it's just kind of to protect your eyes. So they have different variations of ones that are approved ballistic ones. They have ones by Oakley's, Wiley X's. They have some generic ones that the army will issue you. So you can either choose to just usually use the ones that the army issues you. And those are usually pretty good because sometimes they even issue you like nice Wiley X's or Oakley ones, or you can get just approved ballistic eyewear, you know, from a commercial kind of retailer. Those can either be tented, non-tented, they have polarized ones. They usually have different, you know, kind of set standards from that unit that, you know, what's approved and what's not approved. Next, you have the helmet the soldiers will wear. A lot of people still call it the Kevlar, but it's actually the uh, ACH or the Advanced Combat Helmet. Some of you may even be more old school and call it like a K-pot or something crazy, but uh, officially it's the ACH. Usually on that ACH, it's gonna have a mount on the front of it, which is for your night vision goggles, which I'll talk about those a little bit later as well. Another common one is elbow pads and knee pads that soldiers will have to wear based on the unit requirements. Some units will require it, some won't, but you do get issued elbow pads and knee pads when you go to your unit from CIF. CIF is just central issuing facility. This is where you get all your equipment from on that installation. So you do have the elbow pads and knee pads. Some people choose to outsource to commercial versions that are a little bit better than maybe the bulky ones that CIF gave them or 
the ones that they gave them maybe are uncomfortable or whatever. They also have inserts, so some people choose to use the inserts instead of using the actual elbow pads and knee pads. These are just foam padding that kind of goes inside the uniform. There's this little slot inside the uniform that you can actually insert these foam paddings into the knees and into the elbows and provide a little bit of extra comfort and a little bit of padding. That way, if you're taking a knee or you're down on the prone, you have that little bit extra comfort to make it a little easier to be more stable with your shots or just be in a more comfortable position if you're laying on the ground or down on a knee. But like I said, that one will vary based on unit. I know I had my first deployment, they didn't require it. I think you only required to wear knee pads, but you weren't required to wear elbow pads. And then my second deployment, you had to wear both elbow pads and knee pads, but you could get away with using the inserts if you wish as well. And then I've heard other units where they don't require it at all. So that really fluctuates, but that is sometimes a pretty common one. Next, you have the vest or the IOTV, which is the improvised outer tactical vest. This is the vest that's kind of like a bulletproof vest in a way. Uh, it's basically just a vest with a bunch of molly kind of system to it to be able to add pouches. And then you have plates, which is the e sappy plates that go on the inside to kind of help prevent against, you know, any kind of shrapnel damage, certain smaller caliber rounds, things like that. It's not 100% bulletproof, right? You can't stop probably like a, you know, 7.62 round or 50 cal round or sniper rifle, things like that. But maybe it'll slow it down. The main intent usually of that is for smaller caliber rounds, but also like shrapnel. ID goes off, a blast of some sort, then hopefully that shrapnel won't cause as much damage that it might have caused if you didn't have a vest on. Certain old school individuals may remember like the, the flak vest and the different types of vests that they had to wear back then. This one's a much more improved one. It's also got like a easy like to, to pull off cord, you know, that you pull out to make the thing fall apart. So that way if you have a soldier who's been shot, been wounded in some way, you need that vest off in a hurry to treat that wound. There's a little kind of a, a pull cord that's available like underneath the kind of like the neck tab or whatever. And you pull that and the thing falls apart and you can easily treat the wound. It is a pain if you mess with someone and pull that cord because it's kind of difficult to put back together. But you know, some people may have more experience and it's easy to put it back together. But for those who haven't messed with that, if you get that thing pulled on you or whatever, it's a little bit of a pain to, to get everything put back together with all the cords that run through that whole system. Now attached to that IOTV, you're probably gonna have some pouches that contain different equipment. A very common one is med pouch. A lot of people will have some kind of small medical pouch that's, you know, attached to that IOTV that has maybe like basic things, like maybe some, you know, alcohol swabs, maybe some bandages, probably a tourniquet. A lot of times you also have a tourniquet usually in one of like the pockets on the pants maybe or somewhere else that's designated by the unit, but you might have a tourniquet inside of there and just kind of your common things. Anything more advanced like, you know, IV type of things or Motrin or anything else like that, maybe more with a medic and you're probably just going to have some of the basic first aid type of equipment inside that med pouch. Another common thing that soldiers have on that IOTV is maybe a knife or maybe even like some kind of seatbelt cutter. Now it's not really required, right, for you to carry a knife, but a lot of times you get issued one, maybe a Gerber or something that you might have on your belt. Some people have like cool knives that they have attached to the Molly system. I remember during my second deployment, I had a pretty cool uh, black knife that was pretty cool that I got issued to me that was attached to mine. We also had a seatbelt cutter. So if you were in a situation where you're in a vehicle, maybe that vehicle got blown up, got caught on fire somehow or whatever, you need to get out of that vehicle in an emergency, you have this special knife that's specially designed to cut the seatbelt off to get out of that vehicle if maybe you're trapped inside there. So those will kind of vary a little bit, but a lot of soldiers, even though it's not required to have a knife, like to have a knife on them, whether it's on their vest or on their belt. And then of course, you're gonna have ammo pouches because you need to carry the ammunition for your weapon system. The most common weapon system that soldiers are carrying is the M4. There are other variations that I'll talk about a little bit later, but your common one's gonna be the M4. So for that setup for a soldier carrying an M4, the basic combat load is gonna be 210 rounds. So that is going to be seven magazines in the ammo pouches. Each magazine holds 30 rounds. So that means that is the common load. A soldier could maybe choose to carry more. Less is not advised, but that may be a thing where you know a situation comes about where a soldier just isn't carrying the basic combat load. But typically they should be at a minimum carrying that basic load of 210 rounds. So seven magazines, 30 rounds each. Now, like I said, the M4 is the common weapon system that a soldier is carrying around. I'll talk about some variations a little bit later, but with that M4, you have the sights on that M4. You have the basic built-in ones called the iron sights, which are not something that would be common in a combat environment unless it was done for your personal reason. Otherwise, you should probably have some kind of sight attachment on that M4 weapon system. 
Some common ones is like the M68 or the ACOG. The M68 is just like a little red dot kind of system where you look through it and you can see a dot. It doesn't actually project out, but you can see a dot and you've used that to kind of dial it in to get the sights you know, done properly. So that way hopefully that dot is on the target uh, based on your qualification or based on just going to a range and dialing it in. ACOG, the other common one that you might see is just a sight that has a little bit of magnification to it and maybe like a little arrow or something on the inside that kind of lines up as far as where you're uh, dialed in for, for your qualification or for dialing in that site. There may be other variations from other units. Those are just the two common ones, but that's not to say that you won't see other sites at other units. In my experience, my first deployment, I had the M68 site, which I'm not a big fan of. And then my second deployment, I had an ACOG. Some units maybe only give ACOGs for, you know, team leaders or squad leaders or whatever. Uh, that may just depend on your unit though. And then everybody else gets M68. So that'll kind of variation as far as what site you'll get, just usually depends on the unit. And then soldiers will also commonly be carrying their NVGs or their night vision goggles. That is usually a set thing, no matter if it's a day mission or a night mission, because if you're on a day mission and something happens where you were supposed to be back before night, but because of an ambush or because of something else that happened, you're stuck out in the dark and you don't have your night vision goggles, that would be a bad situation. So usually no matter if it's a day mission or a night mission, usually you have your night vision goggles with you no matter what. Now there are different variations to the night vision goggles and I won't get into all of those. Some of the older style ones has two eyepieces. So if you have it attached to your, your Kevlar or to your uh, ACH, it flips down and you have the two eye goggles to be able to look through. Those are a little bit older style and they've kind of started to phase away from those. And now you commonly just have the single eye ones that also flip down so that way you can kind of see through one eye, but then also still have the other eye to see normally. Now, depend on the mission will depend on if it's mounted to your Kevlar or just simply in a bag. Usually if you're just doing a day mission, then it's just in a bag with you, maybe inside of a pouch or something like that. But if you're doing a night mission, you might have that mount attached to that ACH up on the, your helmet, and then you might have your night vision goggles attached to it uh, or something like that. So you won't always just walk around with the night vision goggles on that helmet, it just probably just depends on that mission. On a personal note, night vision goggles aren't as cool as they look like in the movies. I, I mean, yeah, they're neat and everything like that, but it is a little hard to kind of see depth and distance and everything. It's really challenging, especially when you're driving and wearing those. But I mean, yeah, they're handy and they do you know, serve a good purpose, but they're not as cool as sometimes movies make them out to seem. All right, now let's talk about a few variations. Not every single variation, there's probably a ton of variations, but I will talk about a few variations because probably if I don't, you're gonna be asking about, what about this, what about that? So let's talk about some variations anyways. You do have some variations where some soldiers will not carry an M4 and they might carry something like a saw or some kind of machine gun. Usually those are designated soldiers in that platoon to be assigned to be a gunner, a machine gunner, whatever you wanna kinda of use the terminology for. And those individuals, instead of carrying around M4, may have something else that they're carrying around. Like I said, it might be a saw, might be some other sort of machine gun. I don't know if, I don't think they really do 240 Bravos. It might be a little bit extreme, but you have some kind of variation. You also may see some soldiers carry around the nine mil and eventually they have a newer version that they're gonna be going over to and some soldiers might be already utilizing that and some may eventually phase to that, but you have the nine mil or the pistol, let's just maybe keep it generic and have a pistol in that case. And you might see some soldiers just walk around carrying only a pistol. A common MOS you might see your tankers, right? It's just a little easier to not have an M4 inside of that tank with them and they may just carry a pistol with them. There are also sometimes variations where a soldier will have both an M4 and a pistol with them on a mission. And I've seen that a lot of times with uh, certain MOSs, maybe like even certain individuals, like higher ranking individuals. In my situation, I saw like our company commander would carry an M4 plus a nine mil on their side. And then also like our platoon sergeant, which was a staff sergeant or a sergeant first class would carry the, uh, the nine mil as well as their M4 with them. So they would have both and then certain other MOSs would have only the nine mil or only a pistol and not carry an M4. You may also see some variations with the M4 having a 203 attached to that M4, which is a grenade launcher. In those situations, it might be like a team leader, a squad leader, certain individuals that have just been designated to carry the 203 on their M4, not usually everybody, obviously. In my experience, we had our gunners have the 203. So like on my second deployment, when I was in Iraq, it was a little bit kind of, you know, trying to, 
not so heavily in the battle type of you know kind of situation. So you had situations where you needed to do warning shots, and so our gunners inside of our vehicles, instead of using the 50 cal to give a warning shot with, we had non-lethal rounds inside the 203, which are just rubber rounds, and they could fire off a non-lethal round at the vehicle to tell them to back off or whatever maybe the purpose of that kind of warning shot was for, so that you could use something non-lethal rather than using the 50 cal for a warning shot. Obviously, like in the heat of the battle and other situations, you're not doing warning shots, but in that particular situation, we were required to do warning shots for certain situations. So we had that equipped with the gunners. Now on the topic of a grenade launcher, you probably wanna know about grenades. Well, that's usually not a common thing that most soldiers carry around. Sometimes that's limited to certain individuals carrying a grenade. In my cases, like with 88 mics, nobody carried grenades, but you might have the situation like certain uh, infantry soldiers, 11 Bravos, maybe other MOSs, where maybe the team leaders, maybe a squad leader might carry one or two grenades. And I've even talked to some 11 Bravos where they said that we didn't carry grenades at all either because they just didn't need it, right? Maybe the situation didn't call for it. They'd rather have a 203 to have that grenade launcher rather than an actual physical grenade. So there are variations, but there are some people that choose not to carry grenades at all and certain other variations that may have like a team leader or something carrying one. But in a lot of my experience, grenades are actually not a very common thing that a lot of soldiers carry on them. So, but that may vary, like I said. Another variation may include like a radio. There are a lot of different radio systems. So whether it's a man pack, an embedder, whatever the case is, there are some individuals that might carry a radio. That won't be everybody. That's not gonna be everybody carrying a radio. Usually you have radios mounted inside the vehicle, but you have some individuals that are doing dismount operations or may dismount out of the vehicle and have like a different version of that system uh, to be able to use the radio while they're dismounted. So some individuals may have the radio. You may also see this thing looks like a cell phone because it basically is a cell phone that's attached to like the front of the vest that flips down. That is what is called an ATAC. Only certain individuals have those, but it's basically like a Samsung actual device, but it's not really being used like a cell phone, right? They're not playing video games on the thing. It's used like for navigation purposes so they can see where other soldiers are at on the battlefield. They can send up little messages and they can kind of use it to flip down and be able to kind of send stuff up and be able to see where other soldiers are at that are also using the ATAC in that area. So if you ever see that like in photos where it looks like someone's got their cell phone attached to the front of their vest, it's probably not their cell phone, it's probably the ATAC. But yes, it, it is actually, a, I think a Samsung Galaxy something S10 or something like that. I don't remember what specifically device it is, but it is, I think a Samsung cell phone, but it's not being used in that same manner. Now other missions may require you to take a rucksack with you, an assault pack or something like that. It just really depends. Sometimes you have missions where they want you to take an assault pack at a minimum with a couple of MREs inside there. So that way if you're gone longer than expected, you have some MREs with you, or maybe those get, just get stuffed behind a seat or it just depends on the mission really. But there are variations where you may have your rucksack with you or you don't have your rucksack with you. It really just depends sometimes on your leadership, the mission, things like that. So that kind of covers some of the basic kind of load, the basic gear that a soldier might carry and to include some of the variations and there are a ton of variations, right? I didn't list every single variation, but that's some of the common ones that you may kind of see soldiers carry or may have experience with, whatever the case might be. If you have some questions about some of that gear or that loadout, leave them down in the comment section down below. Or I also have now available on ChristopherChaos.com a forum section that you can go to and you can kind of engage with the community and kind of, you know, seek more questions about other topics in that area as well. So either leave some questions down in the comment sections or maybe check out the website to hit up the forums and hit up the community. Down in the comments section, I'm also going to pin a video if you want to continue your viewing experience and you want to learn more about army gear. I have a video that I did in the past about some of the common gear that is issued to soldiers. So check that link down in the pinned comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up for me. I greatly appreciate it. Check out other links and all sorts of other stuff down in the description for more resources. I'm Christopher Chaos. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. See you.